Okay. Well, we're welcome everybody. Thank you for attending our United Nations Association Marin Chapter event. We have it every other month to educate everyone on sustainable development goals of the United Nations. There are 17 goals for a sustainable planet. And our two guest speakers today are Alicia McCutcheon, wave Alicia, mm -hmm. and Martin Wolf. And they'll be uh, speaking to this, to us uh, shortly. Um, an overview of our discussion, as I said, we have our two speakers, uh, and then uh, we'll close closing words with our president, Felicia Chavez. Uh, and I, I believe uh, we're going to open with a short explanation from Ro Rigney. Ro, you're on. Yeah, hi. Am I unmuted? Does everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, I wanted to explain just a little bit about who we are and where we're coming from here. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'll start by saying the United Nations consists of 193 countries around the world, and it's committed to maintaining international peace and security, developing friendly relations among the nations, and promoting social progress, better living standards, and human rights. The United Nations Association is a non-governmental organization in many of the countries of the United Nation. And it's a movement of people just like you and me who believe that our interests and values can be advanced by standing with the United Nations. So there are over 200 chapters in our country, UNA, USA, about 20,000 plus members. And by the way, 60% of them are under the age of 26, which is pretty exciting. Um, the United Nations Association chapters work on a very grassroots level to inform our local community members about the importance of the work that is done by the United Nations. And one of the main things that UNA is focusing on is informing people about what is called the Sustainable Development Goals. These are 17 very specific goals that were created by those 193 countries of the, excuse me, of the United Nations back in 2015. These 17 SDGs, as we call them, Sustainable Development Goals, are sort of, you can think of them as the to-do list to achieve by 2030. And these are goals that include things like mitigating climate change, transparency of government, improving education, and ending hunger and human trafficking. These are goals, by the way, for all of us, for everyone in the whole world. So for me, since I just joined the UNA Marin chapter um, sometime last fall, and I have learned so much about each of these SDGs, and I feel so much more informed and connected to my community here in Novato Marin, and I feel more connected and informed about the world. So my goal today and every day is to learn and be inspired to take action in my daily life and to more broadly share the importance of the great work of the United Nations. So thank you, everybody. We're going to have a great meeting. Thank you, bro. Uh, we have a uh, three minute video here uh, about uh, SDG number 12. And uh, here it goes. Okay. We all deserve to live in a world where everyone's needs are met without harming the planet. When we produce and consume just enough of what we need, 
we reduce the amount of waste contaminating our waterways and clogging up our green spaces. And we can use ethical materials to package goods and power our buildings and industries using renewable energy sources. We all have a role to play in helping the UN ensure sustainable consumption everywhere by the year 2030. In 1940s Britain, thriftiness was deemed patriotic. With the Second World War raging and resources limited, rationing controlled what goods people could purchase. Campaigns like Make Do and Mend saw women give old clothes new life. And the government even made food waste a criminal offense, issuing recipe books to encourage people to grow their own food and make the most of what they had. Responsible consumption contributed toward the war effort. What could it achieve today? The global marketplace gives 21st century consumers access to a wide range of goods at cheap prices. But that means our habits as consumers are changing. With so much choice at our fingertips, we are far less likely to repair and reuse old things and far more likely to buy new things instead. With people in developing countries now starting to have access to these products too, that creates an even greater strain on production. But what happens when we are done with things? Where do they go? We dump over 20,000 taxi cabs full of electronic devices every year. But many of them contain hazardous materials that can seep into our water supply if not disposed of properly. It's easier to prevent bad habits than to break them. But good people everywhere are working on both. In the Bahamas, the humanitarian organization Hands for Hunger is collecting surplus food from hotels, cruise ships, and markets and distributing it to those who need it most. In Japan, residents in the village of Kamikatsu recycle almost 100% of all waste products. They separate their trash into 34 categories, including food, aluminum, and paper flyers. And in the US, Nike leads the way in socially responsible production. They've created Nike Grind Footwear and clothing range using recycled water bottles and other renewable materials. If we are mindful of our consumer habits and companies are mindful of their production processes, together we can build a world where nothing goes to waste. All right. And now we're going to hear from Alicia McCutcheon, uh, the, let me get the correct thing here, Compost Operations Manager of Redwood Landfill Waste Management in Nevada. Alicia McCutcheon has for 20 years, over 20 years of experience at this company, dealing with the complex operations, safety, and environmental issues in the compost, solid waste, and recycling industries. Take it away, Alicia. Hello, Thank Alicia. You. Thank you. Uh, let me start to share my PowerPoint presentation. And you can see my presentation now. Yes. Okay. So th thank you so much for allowing me to speak uh, tonight. Uh, before I get started, I think I'd like to manage expectations a little bit. Um, and I know that you probably want something really holistic about how Marin County is doing uh, in, in totality. Unfortunately, I can only speak to Redwood Landfill. Um, Marin County's garbage goes to three different landfills. We get 50% of it, uh, which constitutes about 80% of uh, the garbage we get in. So we get Marin County's garbage and Petaluma's garbage. Um, and then, I'll, then green waste for composting in a lot from a lot uh, wider uh, area. But uh, just, just know going in, unfortunately, most of what I know is just about Redwood Landfill. I'll try to answer your questions the best I can. 
So first let's do a little history. Redwood Landfill has been in operation since 1958 as a landfill. Um, it was first, it was of course, unfortunately wetlands that were diked up in the thirties by uh, Corps of Engineers. It was first used as pasture land. And then in 1958, it became a landfill. Uh, we began composting in 1998 because of the large amount of um, biosolids or treated sewage sludge that was being uh, produced in Marin and Sonoma counties. But unfortunately, uh, it's hard with uh, sewage sludge compost, biosolids compost, often called co-compost. It's hard to even give it away because there's that big ick factor of it being made with sewage sludge. So we maintain our, uh, our permit and our ability to do that, but we haven't done that for 20, about 20 years. Uh, the property itself is 420 acres. It used to be 540 acres, but uh, WM donated 120 acres around 2006 to the Marin Audubon Society. Uh, they opened the, the levees and uh, turned it back into wetland. And there's a whole host of uh, shorebirds there now. Uh, they make great neighbors. Um, and the waste footprint itself uh, is, is a 220 acre oval on that 420 acre property. We currently have 20 million cubic yards of waste in place. We're permitted for 25 million cubic yards. So that puts the current landfill life out to about 2032. That's only 10 years. And uh, as you probably are aware, uh, California regulations say that a county has to know where its waste is going 15 years in the future. So we'll get to that in a little bit. And as I said before, we're one of three landfills where Marin Car County's garbage goes. And I have a little picture, a uh, little Google Maps picture of us on the side. 55% uh, of all the material that comes through the gate at Redwood Landfill, uh, and that's including the garbage, 55% of it gets diverted, which is a pretty good, pretty good rate. Uh, all soil that is brought in is reused. It's reused on site as um, intermediate cover or uh, road building, pad building, construction, and all the concrete is made into gravel. And it, right now it's just being used on site. We can use everything uh, on site. And we are composting at maximum capacity right now, which our permitted max capacity is 514 tons per day. Uh, and we produced 65,000 cubic yards of compost, produced and sold 65,000 cubic yards of compost in 2021. Right now, uh, everything that we produce compost wise, we can sell, um, but that will, the compost production in Marin County, Sonoma County, that the general wine area there will be steadily increasing as we uh, increase green waste and organics diversion from landfills. And also because uh, now using, uh, when you compost, you get two products. You, you screen the green waste that's composted and you get the fine compost, which you sell. And then you have a chunky, com a chunky leftover product, which is uh, full of contamination. That's normally used as a landfill cover. Now, uh, you can't do that anymore and still get diversion credits for it. So as we clean up that chunky product, which is a perfectly fine mulch when it's clean, now you will also have composted mulches for sale. So we are, are headed towards a, um, a time when there'll be far more composted uh, materials available for sale. And we have to make sure that those markets, that there are markets for that. Uh, AB 1383, uh, SB 1383, 1383 is uh, a current regulation 
that is new and has started and it's to encourage cities and municipalities to purchase composted materials and uh, that way to expand the market so we can certainly get um, more organics out of the landfill. One of those is food waste. We want to make sure that uh, food waste, 1383 uh, speaks to the hierarchy of food waste. First, you want uh, edible food to go to people who can eat it. And then you want it to go for um, a livestock or pet feed um, rendering. And then after that, you want it to go to compost. Uh, right now, you can see a picture of our compost in, uh, in, in front of you. And that compost, even though pretty much everybody in Marin County has access to put at least vegetative food waste in their compost, um, most people can put even meat waste in there. It's less than 5% food waste. So we have, uh, it's, we have a lot of expansion that we can do with that. But as I just said, uh, right now, uh, Redwood Landfill is operating at peak capacity with regard to compost. So what do we do? We, we're getting close to capacity um, of everything. So what we want to do is extend the life of the landfill until 2046. And that, um, that involves the word expansion, which makes me cringe because I was around for the last Redwood Landfill expansion. It was very contentious, but um, if as long as we, if we can divert more and more materials from the disposal at the landfill, um, we can increase that 2046 in, you know, infinitum, in far, far into the future. So what we are doing right now is uh, formulating our application for the county. And of course, we'll, we'll meet many times with the county before we put this in, in front of the public so that it's absolutely what the county and the public wants um, to extend the life of the landfill to 2046 uh, by not, not increasing that 220 acre footprint, but by uh, having the landfill go taller and steepening the side slopes. Uh, we've had it analyzed and it's still completely structurally sound if we do that and it would increase the life for 15 additional years and we want to increase organic processing since right now we're not we're unsure of the um, the expansion of compost markets we want to put in uh, anaerobic digestion so with anaerobic digestion, eventually at the end of the process, you do end up with a, a soil amendment, but you will have reduced the volume of the material significantly. So with anaerobic digestion, you put the material into a vessel, uh, which uh, some, sometimes you use water, sometimes you don't, to create methane, use the methane for energy. Right now, uh, Redwood Landfill has a landfill gas to energy plant where we're currently using methane for the landfill to create electricity. Uh, anaerobic digestion of organics would also create electricity. And then uh, even after 2046 or whatever our closure date is, there will still be composting and other diversion activities at the landfill. Um, I I think that is my last slide, but um, I can go back. I think I forgot to talk about uh, actually how much material is being brought into the landfill. Uh, right now we get between seven and 800 tons per day of, of waste, which goes directly into the landfill. We get about 300 tons per day of what we call alternative daily cover, uh, which is wood, um, find, uh, look, finds from recycling operations. We call them MRF finds. Uh, they come from the material recovery facility at, um, at like the one in, uh, in San Rafael. 
uh, we get about 900 tons a day of uh, when you add soil and concrete in. So that ends up uh, 900 to 1,000 tons a day ends up being really important in uh, Marin County's diversion rate because it's it's just so heavy. Um, and we don't have uh, we don't have a a limit uh, for soil and concrete. We just make sure that it, we bring it in in a sustainable in a in a level that's sustainable for us to use or sell. I do not think that I took up 20 minutes, but um, this is uh, the one of the Redwood Landfill jackrabbits, and I always like to end the presentation with him. And here's my contact information that you take down and uh, always call me or email me if you'd like a tour of the landfill or if you have any questions about what's happening. Thank you very much, Alicia. Now, uh, maybe her presentations has triggered somebody's uh, question. So do we have any questions? There's Looks Ro. like Rick has his hand up. Okay. And then I have a question also. Rick and Ro and, and Felicia. Thank you. Um, Alicia, I take it you work for Redwood uh, Landfill, but I'm not quite clear who owns Redwood Landfill. Is it a private company or is it a government agency? It, it is a private company. Uh, it's owned by WM, which until recently was known as Waste Management, which is a publicly traded company out of Houston, Texas. I see. And um, here in Sonoma County, our garbage is collected by Recology. So waste management is essentially the equivalent of that for Marin, is that right? Uh, we only uh, we are actually the equivalent of that for Alameda County. Uh, in Marin, we only operate the landfill. So, like your landfill is operated by Republic, uh, we but the county owns the landfill instead of Republic. We own and operate uh, Redwood Landfill. I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, Alicia, thank you for your presentation. I'm wondering, uh, I've read recently about um, uh, legislature or bills or the efforts, especially here in California, I believe, to make sure that there is no food waste, nothing compostable in regular garbage. And um, I'm wondering, have you seen a, an increase of material coming in? Um, has that changed um, in the last five or 10 years since composting has been, uh, people have been learning more and more about the importance of composting and recycling? Uh, in, we used to, uh, our compost, the way we used to compost is called uh, windrows, and so we would just lay out the um, lay out the compost in in just long rows, the green waste, and we would compost it that way. Um, in 2014, we went to a different style. The style you see behind me is called covered aerated static piles, and it allowed us to um, triple uh, the amount of compost we we took. And so it's hard to tell because as soon as we said, hey, we'll take, instead of taking 170 tons per day, we'll take 514 tons per day, everyone went, yes, and, and we were full again. So I think there's just such a, I can't tell because there's just such a demand out there for organics processing. Um, and we really, when that happened, we also, it's odd, we also have not really seen much of a decrease in inbound waste. So since um, Central Landfill in Sonoma County opened back up in, I think it was around 2012, um, it, uh, our, our inbound 
garbage has been pretty steady between 700 and 800 tons per day. Um, but as, as much organics processing infrastructure that we create, it seems like we can fill it. Um, luckily, there, there are, well, I can only think of one more facility that's coming online. And the gentleman who owns Cold Creek Compost and um, in uh, Mendocino County is opening up a facility in Sonoma County. And I believe that'll give the area about 300 tons per day more uh, organic processing capacity. But still, I, I think you can fill that up instantly. Thank you. So, um, Alicia, I just want to say that because you and your coworkers are on the front line of our unsustainable society, I feel like what you guys have to share is very important. So thank you for thank you for your presentation today. I mean, if I had my way, I would have photographs of the landfill published on the front page of the Marin I Day IJ like every day so that people can see their old dust buster or their old sleeping bag or their old tire, you know, whatever it is that actually physically, like I, I want us to have a much more visceral experience of the trash process. Um, like, you know, if we could take a little thing and stick it against, stick it into something and like track it and where it ends up, you know, like a, we need a really visceral experience of exactly what happens to what a way actually is. So, um, so like at the beginning you were saying, well, I don't know if I have too much to share about, but this is like the essence of SDG 12 is like, where is a way? And you guys know, and most people have no clue. So, um, as much as you guys can get out and give people that visceral experience. And so again, just thanks for, for bringing all this. I did want to just kind of query, like, like, is it, is it, is it uplifting? Is it depressing? Is it kind of neutral to sort of see that you guys are at like 50% diversion? Um, and is it, is that like you said, oh, that's not bad, you know? So is that, is that like, has that increased? I'm assuming that's gotten better over time um, as facilities processes have gotten better, but like also I'm assuming you guys see where we're failing. So can you say any more about that? Um, I think it, it, it is a little disheartening sometimes. Um, not, not all, uh, not all municipalities and not all construction and demolition process, uh, like construction and demolition uh, projects take the materials out that can be reused before they just smash it all and send it in bulk for recycling. We do recycle uh, construction and demolition debris. Uh, most of that, go we just get it for transfer. We get maybe uh, 20 tons a day for to transfer either up to um, a facility in Sonoma County or down to San Rafael. Um, if you, you know, you see the like cabinets that are going to recycling and they were real wood, not the particle board that you see today. And it is a little disheartening sometimes. And, um, you know, we're all, all, everybody that works there, when you look at the waste is disheartened at times, but it is improving. And, um, we are, really excited about uh, 1383 because uh, we get new equipment and uh, hopefully this new equipment that we're going to be working with will will clean up the what we call compost overs which is the the chunky stuff the composted mulch uh, that orchards can use um, so right now we're uplifted by that there's there's hope and it, it always it it it's it's kind of like turning a battleship in and it's just so slow <laughs> and it shouldn't be that slow, but it is, but it is always incrementally better rather than worse. Thank you. I have another quick question, Alicia. Um, you said that the compost is being sold a lot, uh, some of it. Can you tell us who it's being sold to and maybe some of the goals of who you'd like to be see purchasing it? 
Uh, right now, ours is sold mostly in bulk and mostly to either vineyards or uh, vineyard management companies or to soil yards that do blends for vineyards. If you're not near agriculture, uh, it's hard to make composting pencil out because once you ship it uh, with the extraordinary high price of diesel fuel, once you go more than 30 miles, it's it's just prohibitive, prohibitively expensive for farmers. Uh, but luckily we are right by agriculture, a thriving wine industry. And uh, so that's who we sell it to. And we hope there's also a vineyards use mulch, um, orchards use mulch, and there's mulch on playgrounds, there's mulch in public parks. So, uh, which is really the, the goal of 1383 is to get cities and municipalities and park districts and everybody to, to come in and, you know, you have a, a, a patch of dead grass, don't just, don't use chemical fertilizers on it. Buy the, the native seed, buy some really good compost and use it. Whatever application you can use it for, use it. And um, that will, the more organic material that we can ship out, the more we can take and prove that we should be able to expand not just into anaerobic digestion, but even more uh, into composting. Thank you. I think Kay has her hand raised. Oh, you're on mute. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was really great. I live in San Rafael with Marin Sanitary and I always, do you take care of their compost? We have mandatory green cans now. We, we do. Um, most, we certainly get all of San Rafael. I don't think we get all of everything Marin Sanitary picks up, but we get San Rafael's. Right. That, I mean, I think they take care of their plastic or they try. <laughs> yeah, they, they um, San Rafael's, uh, anything coming in from Marin Sanitary is pre-ground. So mm -hmm. what most, most green waste comes in, we have to grind it up uh, into four inch pieces. Anything from Marin Sanitary comes in pre-picked and pre-ground. Yeah, it's pristine. I love their stuff. Oh. <laughs> I've gotten some from them on their free day. Occasionally I'm around. So I, put, well, I like that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. No, I don't know. Anyway, I have a question, but I don't think anybody can hear me. I could hear somebody for a little bit. I could hear you, Marsha. Yeah. We heard you, Marsha, and I think you accidentally actually muted we yourself muted. now. Oh, there, there you go. Okay. And Alicia, if okay. you unshare your screen, we can see you a little bit better. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I can't. Can anybody hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, so I'm not. I'm not really clear about this. I live in Mill Valley, and there's no, there's no real composting uh, situation that I'm aware of. I have my own compost, and <clears throat> uh, in terms of putting food into garbage. <clears throat> that's not is that something one I mean I never do that but is that something people aren't supposed to do it sounds like um and well it, you should you ha should have the option of a green can um and even if you live in a hum I have the garden cuttings <clears throat> for the green can so yes. if I have any <clears throat> meat I should put that in the green can Yes, you should be able. Meat. You should be able to so, mix your food scraps with uh, your yard waste in your green can. Okay, all right, that's interesting because I I have my own compost that goes into soil that we use in the garden, but I know that in some places they sell the compost. You know, there's a separate section in the can, and you sell the uh, San Francisco. I think sells the compost. Yeah, and we uh, we do too. So Mill Valley brings the green waste to us. Uh, Mill Valley Refuse brings the green waste to us from uh, Mill Valley, 
I'm not sure we get it from everywhere they collect, but we get it from Mill Valley. Uh, we'll compost it, and then uh, you can come to Novato and buy as much of it as you like. And we do bag a little bit of it. So um, if you just want like a, a cubic foot bag, you could buy that. Right. But but I have my own, but I just was, I'm, I'm interested because I've seen people throw food and everything else into the garbage can. So that's, is a no-no, I guess. Yes. Um, and uh, I, the Mill Valley Refuse website, uh, Memory Serves is actually quite good with its uh, little pictogram of what you can put and where. Okay, yeah, I, I think they send that to us, but yeah, okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Alicia. There's a lot in that presentation that I was totally unaware of, so thank you. Kind of filling us in, and it's because we all, we, when we drive north, we always look over there and wonder what's, what's going on, you know. Now we're going to switch over to uh, Martin Wolf. Martin Wolf uh, is the director of Sustainability and Authenticity at Seventh Generation Incorporated. He's responsible for creating frameworks of, for the design of sustainable products at Seventh Generation. He works with and influences other businesses, industry associations, legislators, le legislators, and regulators in this regard. Martin, all yours. Thank you, and we'll see if I can successfully share my screen. And hopefully you can see my screen now and you can hear me. So first, uh, I'm going to very briefly introduce Seventh Generation then talk a bit about sustainability and how product environmental life cycles need to be studied and understood to create sustainable products and make sure that they are used in a sustainable way. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'll hopefully leave time for some uh, questions, answers, and discussion. And I'll warn you, I'm going to be asking you questions. Uh, and if you can respond, it would be great. I can't see you because of the way my screen is set up. So just shout out answers if you have an answer or put them in the chat. So here goes. Uh, seventh generation was started about 30 years ago. We make household cleaning products, products from recovered paper, uh, such as uh, paper towels, bath tissue, napkins, uh, baby diapers, and uh, feminine hygiene products. And uh, we like to think we do business differently in that we try to design our products to be more sustainable and we are a certified B Corporation. So most companies in the United States, and in fact, the world, are what are called C Corporations. They have boards of directors that have a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders of the company. And this makes perfect sense given all of the financial shenanigans that occurred in the 1920s leading to the depression of the 1930s. B corporations, on the other hand, have a board of directors with a fiduciary responsibility, not only to the shareholders, but to the employees of the company, to the communities in which the company operates, and to the environment. So it's a much broader mandate. And I think it's a necessary mandate if business is truly to be a force for good, as business claims it wants to be. So if I had my way, uh, all C companies would be dissolved and reincorporated as B corporations. So the name seventh generation comes from the uh, Iroquois Confederacy, a confederation of five Native American tribes that was formed in the 17th century to uh, compete economically with the European settlers who were coming and uh, with their superior uh, uh, armaments for hunting, trapping, and such were actually interfering with the uh, 
what had been a sustainable lifestyle of the uh, Native American uh, peoples. And as part of their confederation, they have a constitution called the Great Law. And one of the great laws is in our every deliberation, we will consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations. Something that's extremely difficult to do, particularly when you have to report financial results every month and every quarter, but it is the basis of doing things in a more sustainable and equitable way. And our company has a mission, which is to transform the world into a healthy, sustainable and equitable place for the next seven generations. And the important thing about this mission is it has nothing to do with our business. We see our business as providing the fuel, the funding to work toward our mission. So our business decisions are made to make sure that we are a profitable and sustainable business. But the purpose of that business is not merely to make money, it is to transform the world. So we like to think that also is different. So here we are on sustainability, and this is going to be my first question. Does anyone have a definition for sustainability? Shout it out. Okay, I'm not hearing it. And it's surprising because the definition comes from the United Nations Sustainable Development Commission, also called the Brundtland Commission. And it's the practice of meeting today's needs without diminishing the ability to meet tomorrow's needs or future generations needs. And I love this definition because it doesn't say what our needs are, doesn't say what future needs are. It just says the resources we are using today to meet our needs should be available for future generations to meet their needs. Okay, here comes the first question. Does anyone recognize this object? The satellite. It's a very special satellite though. The space station? Exactly, it's the International Space Station. One of the few objects in uh, our universe that has earthlings living on it besides Earth. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and the point is they are living there. They are consuming materials and uh, performing scientific experiments, etc. Does anyone recognize this object? Garbage you... disposal? <laughs> yes, <laughs> it serves two purposes. One, it, it is to give it a name, the SpaceX Dragon resupply capsule. And every two or three months, it gets sent up to the International Space Station and not only delivers supplies, but things like uniforms, which normally we would wash, but they can't because they don't have washing machines, they're too resource intensive, uh, goes into the space capsule, which then burns up on its way back to Earth, or it used to burn up, now they actually can recover it. Why do they have to send a resupply capsule to the space station every two or three months? It costs millions of dollars to do that. Anyone? Space stations are not sustainable. Exactly. The space station consumes resources much faster than they can regenerate it. So to sustain life on the International Space Station, they have to keep sending up supplies. Seems fairly obvious. Okay, this is, uh, I think, a softball question, but we'll see. Does anyone recognize that object? It's like the earth. It is indeed the earth. And, and uh, Marsha, I see you're taking pictures. Let me tell you that this presentation will be available. I, I've sent it to Felicia and she can distribute it to you. It's, it's the earth as seen from space, probably the moon. It, exactly. This is actually one of the first pictures taken, um, I think is one of the Apollo missions when they were getting far enough away to take pictures like this. and. 
I don't know if any of you know the name Buckminster Fuller, but he was oh, yeah. an architect. He designed the geodesic dome. He saw these pictures and he called this spaceship Earth for the obvious reason it is floating in space, just like a spaceship. So here's my next question. This one's a little more difficult. When is the next resupply capsule coming to Spaceship Earth? Never. <laughs> well, I, I don't think we have one scheduled. So uh, not for the foreseeable future anyway. And the reason I went through the series of slides was to I hope impress upon you the fact that the resources that are on the earth today and sustain us are going to have to sustain next generations of people and other beings, whatever beings inhabit the earth. And the question is, is that possible? Is it doable? So for the next question, <clears throat> I want you to think about how old you are. And you do not have to answer that question out loud, but I'm sure you have a number in mind. So my next question for you is, what's something of which you are made? What, you know, there's a statistic that 60% six, of our bodies are this one material. Water. Water, Water. okay. So you thought you were somewhere between, I'm going to guess, 20 and maybe 70 years old. Um, how old is that water? Is it also 20, 30, 40, 50 years old? No. Billions. Uh, was that billions. Bi billions with the B? That is correct. The water of which we are made is somewhere between 7 and 11 billion years old. And... When the earth coalesced and was formed, that water uh, was captured by the earth and it has been here to sustain each generation on life as that generation of life has developed. So it was here for the first single-celled animals in the oceans, it was here for the fish, it was here for uh, the amphibians that crawled out of the oceans onto land. It was here for the first dinosaurs, for the mammals, for us. That water has been used over and over again to sustain each um, generation of life on this earth. And nature does that by functioning in cycles. So we all grew up learning about the water cycle. There's an oxygen cycle, a carbon cycle, a phosphorus cycle, a nitrogen cycle. Nature uses and reuses materials over and over again. And we need to learn how to do that so we can sustain life on this planet in the same way nature has. And I'll also point out that that means you are made out of recycled materials. Mm -hmm. That water, that carbon, that phosphorus, that calcium, that is your body has been used before by generation after generation of life. So Alicia, thank you for collecting those materials and making sure that they are recycled. Okay, so with this as the basis for uh, recycling, how we think about recycling, let's think about sustainable product design. So we want to ensure that both the production of products and the consumption is sustainable, SDG 12. One thing we can do is look at what's called the life cycle of a product. So if you look at the picture on uh, the left-hand side, you'll see that we are taking resources from the earth, we're manufacturing things, then we are using those things possibly consuming them. And some things can be recovered and go through the cycle again, but some things go to waste. And anytime something goes to waste, we have to consume more resources to replace it. So the more we can stay in that loop and go around and around, the more sustainable we can be and the less of a burden 
we will be on Earth's resources. And this goes for the energy we use. If we could use renewable energy instead of using petroleum and coal, not only will we prolong those resources, but we won't be disrupting the cycles that are sustaining us. We all know about the disruption that's being caused by uh, generation of carbon dioxide because of the burning of fossil fuels, leading to higher temperatures, shifting climate patterns, drought, wildfires, et cetera. You are acutely and painfully aware of these. And also the more that we use and reuse and recycle materials, the less waste we produce and the longer the uh, redwood landfill will last. In fact, if we're really good, we might even uh, put Alicia out of a job and we might not need that landfill. It will become a transfer station to recover materials for use and reuse. So what we need to do is consider not just how we manufacture products, not only consider making sure the materials we are taking from the earth are being taken in a sustainable way, we need to make sure that the energy we're using to produce products and use them is sustainable. And this in part comes from sustainable product design, but it also involves sustainable product use. And if something was well-designed, having a sustainable after use, the ability to recover, refill, repair, in some way recycle that material. So it, it's not simply a product design issue and it's not simply an afterlife issue, it's a system issue. We have to look at the entire life cycle of what we produce and what we use and how we I won't even use the D word, I'll say in how we recover it for reuse after use. So we have to start thinking not in the narrow focus of designing a product or recycling a material, but we have to think of the entire system of production and consumption and think of it in the way that nature thinks of it or does it so that everything is used and reused to sustain generation after generation of life. So at seventh generation, we do this in the following ways. We take ingredients from plants or materials from plants. We make ingredients from them. Those ingredients are designed to be biodegradable so that they go back into their fundamental components that can be taken up by plants to generate oils and carbohydrates that we can again collect to make into ingredients and repeat the cycle. Similarly, all of our, I can't say all, most of our packaging starts as a recycled plastic, a plastic that's been recovered. Right now, our average is about 86% recycled content in our plastics, but we also design our packaging to be recyclable so that um, it can be recovered and be used to make new objects like new bottles. So again, we think in terms of, and we design in terms of the renewability of our ingredients and the recyclability of our packaging. It's also really important to educate the consumer one about the fact that the bottles they are purchasing are made from recycled plastic and can be recycled. So this label is called the how to recycle label and we use it on seventh generations packaging. Uh, in California, you just passed a law SB 343 that requires uh, a label like this be used only when a product is truly recyclable in California's infrastructure. And we're working both with the state of California and with the Sustainable Packaging Coalition, which produces this label to make sure we are labeling things correctly 
and informing consumers of how to do this properly. Now, some people say, well, it's up to the consumer to make sure that she recycles properly. And I say that's nonsense. It's up to companies and municipalities and legislatures to make sure that the infrastructure exists for consumers to recycle easily. That means all packaging should be readily recyclable. We should use coding that makes it easy to recycle. We all know about the blue bin and uh, we can put recyclable materials in our blue bin. The problem is people don't really know what goes in their uh, blue bin. They do what's called wish cycling and put non-recyclable materials in there hoping it can be recycled. Well, if there was a blue stripe on that bottle, people could know, oh, that goes in the blue bin. If there was a black stripe, people would say, oh, that's not recyclable, that can only go in trash. If there's a green stripe, it could go into the green can because it would be compostable and people would be able to quickly identify where that material gets properly disposed of. So again, this is a system issue. It's thinking about how we can make an infrastructure that is simple for consumers to navigate as compared to the mishmash of miscommunication that we have today. So pulling this all together, we talked a little bit about the environmental design of our products. I didn't talk about how we try to make our products healthier, but we have rules that uh, require we do not use any carcinogens, mutagens, endocrine disruptors, or any of the other toxics that are present. And importantly, we recognize that consumers expect a cer certain level of performance when they pay a certain amount for a product. There are value brands where consumers accept a lower performance because they're paying a lower price. And there are premium brands where consumers pay more, but they expect higher performance. You have Cadillacs and you have Chevrolets. Um, okay. So uh, the same is true in the consumer product world and companies not only have to be concerned about the impacts on health of their products and the environmental sustainability of their products, but they have to be aware of and conform to consumer expectations. So congratulations to California. I'm sure you are all aware of the passage of SB 54, the California Plastic Pollution Prevention and Packaging Producer Responsibility Act. That was a tough one to say. Seventh generation actually actively worked with um, your legislator, legislature with Senator Allen to uh, see that bill passed. Um, and we look at it as a real triumph and sets California uh, as a leader in the field of extended producer responsibility. And just a reminder that none of us can change the world working alone. We have to work together to change the way we conduct commerce and make it more sustainable. So with that, uh, I'll open it up for questions and I thank you for your attention. That is my email for anyone who wants to uh, contact me. Thank you. So I can see, Rick, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, I like your idea of the, of the black, green, and blue stripes on um, uh, containers. But isn't there a little bit of problem there? Um, uh, I think that what goes in the blue can varies a lot from locality lo to locality. Uh, well, that's one of the problems. And I think one of the things SB 54 is doing is giving the Cal Recycle uh, Authority to decide what can go in a blue bin. Uh, and it's based on the availability of recycling facilities. And I think that's the right approach. Uh, decide what can be readily recycled and uh, everything else gets a black mark, literally, <laughs> because it can't be recycled. And those things that can be recycled go into the 
uh, blue bin. Cornelius. Cornelius, okay. you're- Yeah, got my- Here you are. Out there. <laughs> great, well, thanks. Uh, great presentation and thanks for Seventh Generation existing and continuing to do uh, everything and make some <laughs> options uh, for us in the, <laughs> the so-called marketplace. But my, so I guess I have two kind of questions uh, that might be bigger questions. One is, um, what are the challenges uh, that the company faces really competing in this like totally unfair, uh, tilted, you know, market for, you know, people who aren't uh, frankly giving a crap about you know tomorrow let alone the next generation or seven generations number one and then number two um uh, you know a lot of it is um a lot of uh is education and methods but uh, you know a lot of that is known it's just it's just it's not gonna happen unless the numbers work out because of the, the, the root ethos of extracting profit based on transactions. And so you don't need it to be circular. It, it can be linear and you can, you can extract more from each transaction. That seems to be the system we've set up. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I imagine those are challenges you think about all the time. <laughs> Those indeed are the challenges. First, I also want to point out that Marsha is displaying some seventh generation products. And uh, thank you very much, Marsha. Uh, I should probably do that also. <laughs> but, uh, well, you know, there's an issue of what I'll call incumbency. Uh, companies that have been in business have had literally decades to uh, refine their supply chains, develop low cost paths, and consumers are extremely sensitive to cost. So we need to, in some way, level the playing field and get companies shake, shake up their supply chains so that they can be, <laughs> thank you, Bonnie and Skip, <laughs> uh, get them to be um, more, uh, balanced in their economic approaches. So for example, we all know about the problem of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We've been trying to get uh, uh, carbon taxes in place for more than a decade now, unsuccessfully. California has joined Ontario with the carbon market, which helps to some extent, uh, but it doesn't help completely. Uh, another issue with incumbency is the use of toxic materials. Companies say, well, if we only use a little bit of a toxic material, no one's going to get hurt or so few people will get hurt. It really won't matter. I think the number uh, the US EPA and most businesses use, and I think even DTSC uses, is one in 100,000 excess tumors or excess deaths uh, from the amount of a carcinogen and material. When I ask people, how much of a carcinogen do you want in your products? Most everyone says none. No one says, well, yeah, I'll take that one in 100,000 risk. That's okay. Uh, but companies get away with it because they don't have to tell you what's in their products. Until 2017, when Seventh Generation again worked with Senator Allen to pass California SB 258, the Cleaning Product Right to Know Act of 2017. So now companies do have to label, at least cleaning companies do have to label what is in their products. So it's not a level playing field. Incumbency has its rewards as we, we learned from the orange malevolence that we had to deal with uh, for a while. So um, <clears throat> let's work to level the playing field and uh, reduce the benefit of that incumbency. Alicia, you had your hand up. Just as an aside, uh, you said compostable plastics and my, my ears perked up. If, you, uh, if your green waste uh, comes to Redwood Landfill, don't put uh, compostable plastics in your green can because we can't accept them. 
left just a little aside. Thank you for that correction. Thank you. An important one. <laughs> it's just here. It's it's confusing, just like recyclables, because it's different everywhere. Yep. Again, hopefully DTSC will help straighten that out. Rick, I see your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, there's uh, nothing whatsoever in the United States Constitution about co corporations. Uh, anything to do with corporations is entirely um, legislative in origin. And I just mentioned that because going back to Cornelius's point, uh, there's no legal reason. Obviously, there's a lot of political reasons why there have to be C corporations at all. Uh, if the uh, legislature had the audacity to do so, they could simply do all, co all corporations have to be B. And that's something I would like to see happen. That's one, if I could wave a magic wand, that would be one of the first changes. Felicia. Yeah, I actually just wanted to ask you a little bit more for your insider view on um, a challenge that my household faces, which is synthetic fragrance. So one of the reasons our household is probably at any point in time, there's at least one, maybe probably multiple seventh generation products in our household is because there are, from what I've seen, there are not synthetic fragrances. And it's one of those things that, you know, at the moment um, where we live, we don't have like, for example, our own washer and dryer. So we do laundry at a laundromat, but it's a circus every single week that we go to do laundry, sniffing out the washers, sniffing out the dryers, because our house is so, you know, quote unquote clean. The moment we walk in the door, it's like our nose turns back on and we smell the disaster we made of our laundry if we didn't pick the right machines. And it's like kind of a drama because then we literally will smell it for the next week on our clothes, on our, on our hands and our skin. And I just had a, a reunion with some family members and there was a lot of times I just kind of stood on the other side of the room because of the smells in their hair products, the smells in, you know, of their, of their clothing, you know, because I, again, it's just, I'm just not used to that. And yet most people are kind of living in a soup of synthetic fragrance and our smell kind of regulates itself down. So you kind of don't notice a lot. So they increase the smell and then you notice it less and they increase the smell. And it's just, it's like a war on our noses for those of us who make a concerted effort to avoid it. So thank you, seventh generation. <laughs> so I, I am a, zero fragrance person also. I love our free and clear product lines. There is so much pressure from marketing to add fragrance. They say this is what consumers love and want and it's one of the main drivers of purchase. And I, I am with you, it should not be. Uh, it's like sugar, you know, if you give people two cookies, one with higher levels of sugar, but everything else identical, people prefer the higher level of sugar. Or loudspeakers, they prefer the louder loudspeaker. Um, uh, and to your point, that diminishes your sensitivity to the product, whether it's sugar, fragrance, or a sound system. And you then want more sugar, more sound, more fragrance, whatever it is. I walked into and I'm sorry to have to say this, my son's house once, and he had a uh, conventional brand dish liquid. And I went to do the dishes and I had to leave the kitchen. So when that dish liquid hit the hot water and it released that fragrance, it, it just made me, gave me a headache almost instantaneously. I can't walk down the detergent dial in, in the uh, grocery store. It just smells too strong. So I'm with you, Felicia, and I think I want to bring you to seventh generation to talk to our marketing department and give them a dose of the reality that there are people who don't want more fragrance in their products. So thank you. Amen. Ro. <laughs> thank you. Um, the SB 54, uh, that's about all packaging being compostable or re recyclable. Is that correct by 2035 or something? I, I think that is the number. Uh, I know there's a 60% in there. That might be 2030, but yes, it's like a- an intermediate goal. Yeah, there, you, there are phased goals. Can you tell me what's being done with these plastics that currently are not recyclable, the ones that don't hold their shape. And this is 
a question for Alicia as well. Um, you know, if we're going to be able to recycle, what kind of movement is happening with that kind of plastic? Does either of you know? So I, I can't speak specifically to Redwood and maybe I'll let Alicia answer that first, but properly any of those multi-laminate films should be going into landfill because they are not recyclable. Alicia? Well, we don't take any of Marin County single stream to Redwood landfill, but uh, it's very confusing. Every music, every, uh, I used to work in recycling in San Leandro and Alameda County and every, every city, every municipality has different um, numbers, types of plastic that they uh that they are willing to uh recycle because some some things of course you get paid to recycle and then some things you pay to recycle um so you, you just have to look at what your uh what your hauler says is he can take to be taken for recycling but yeah all of that anything that's not on there uh goes into the landfill hopefully before it gets shipped halfway across the planet. Yep. So Bonnie, I, yeah, I see you're holding one of our uh, either laundry or auto dish packages. Yeah, yeah, I think I both, right? Oh. Yeah, this is, this is the laundry and uh, uh, Bonnie has a question, but I'm just gonna make a comment first. And that is, uh, love this, love this product. Ultra easy to use. One little pillow in the laundry does the whole job. And now, now her question. <laughs> Wait, um, so it says on the back here that it's like that little, so that means this whole package itself is recyclable, which I find interesting. Is that yes. correct? It, it, it is, but you have to check locally. Uh, okay. Typically, it is returned uh, with grocery bags uh, and put in, I don't know if this is common in California, but here in Vermont, groceries have a, a bin. When you go in, you can bring back your plastic uh, uh, grocery bag and you can put that with it. Actually, in Vermont, we banned plastic grocery bags. I think that also happened in San Francisco and some other uh, California municipalities, but our grocery stores still take back those flexible films, typically number two and number four plastics. But we worked with Dow Chemical to make a, a mono polymer uh, bag, a polyolefin bag that could be recycled because the multi, what they call multi-laminate bags, which have multiple layers of different polymers, uh, can't be recycled because you can't separate the polymers to reuse them. So mm -hmm. that was a special project and uh, uh, worked out very well. Uh, so then the question would be that, it, was that included in the SP54, that this type of bag? No, we did this oh, six or seven years ago. We, we just did that on a, as part of our fulfillment of our mission to make a sustainable planet for the next seven generations. Okay, well, anyway, thank you so much for all your information and for your great products. Oh, so thank you. It. So nice to walk into a room with so many people using our products. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and Bonnie, your hand is still up. Bonnie and Skip. <laughs> I have a follow-up question. Sure. Just um, related to the plastics, I've heard, um, and, you know, kind of going back to Cordelia's question too about like challenges that the that the company that Seventh Generation might face. I've heard a number of food manufacturers who like, you know, they can they can pay their employees appropriately. They can, you know, uh, source organic ingredients, but when it comes to the packaging, they're really stymied. Um, and so I just wonder, you know, like that plastic bag, um, 
I, I don't know that we could recycle that bag in Marin County. I would doubt it actually, but maybe it's possible. I don't know. So things like that, like what are, what are the barriers to seventh generation really like pressing on the gas, the, the eco friendly <laughs> uh, car in my metaphor. Sure. Um, yeah. So, so things like that, that are, that you guys wish were different. So, so he, here is where it gets into infrastructure and systemic approaches. I'd say the biggest barrier is that so many different municipalities or counties just have different rules, as Alicia said. Some things can go in a blue bin in some areas, so other areas can't. Here, our blue bins are supposed to take any uh, uh, plastic number one through seven, as long as it looks like a... Um, a bottle or a container, um, and it's not black. Some places will only take number one or two. And it not only varies from state to state, but it could vary from county to county or even town to adjacent town. So getting a consistent and uniform set of uh, uh, rules would allow companies to focus on uh, meeting those rules and making more recyclable materials. I'd like to tell a story. Um, we were purchased by Unilever in 2016. And uh, that year, I went to Unilever headquarters in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, and I met with their sustainability officer. And he said, well, what's your recycling rate? And I said, well, we have about 86% post-consumer recycled material in our packages and 97% of our packaging is recyclable, widely recyclable, meaning more than 60% of the country can accept it. And their packaging engineer, sustainable packaging engineer was there and he turned to her and said, what's Unilever's rate? And she said 1.4%. Oh. Uh, <laughs> So he looked at her and said, find out what they're doing and let's do it. And this year, so it's five years later, Unilever had 25% recycling. Uh, so exactly, you can make these changes happen. And we need to see, I mean, seventh generation for all the good it does is so small that if everyone at Unilever held their breath for 30 seconds, they'd probably save more CO2 than seventh generation saves every year uh, <laughs> going through all the machinations that we do. So it really is uh, important to get the infrastructure changed, to get the large companies to change and just see commerce transformed to be a more sustainable commerce. Kay, your hand is up. You're on mute. My understanding is that Marin Sanitary doesn't like clamshells, and, which are number ones. And actually I send them all to Morgan Hill where my sister lives because their recycle people will take them. <laughs> And, and good for you for taking that initiative to do that instead of just saying it. But I'd like to, I would like Marin Sanitary to do them, but they, they take tubs that are, you know, like number one or two. Clamshells are. Mm -hmm. But the last I heard, they didn't take clamshells, which are very, very prevalent, unfortunately. At least they're not polystyrene clamshells. Well, that's true. <laughs> I think that's pretty well gone around here. Any other questions? You may have already, already answered this, uh, Martin, but uh, have you noticed any positive influence? from your company on other uh, companies? Absolutely. So uh, because we were acquired by Unilever, we have a very direct impact on Unilever. And in fact, they just adopted a strategy they call clean futures that 
is going to be 100% bio-based, 100% biodegradable. It's everything I just told you about seventh generation's product design. They, in fact, call seventh generation clean present because we're already doing the things they hope to do by 2030. Wow. But beyond Unilever, we're a member of what's called the American Cleaning Institute, which is the uh, uh, business association of cleaning product companies like Procter & Gamble and Henkel and uh, uh, some of the others, uh, SC Johnson, I'm trying to not leave anyone out here. In any event, uh, we've worked with them uh, in 2006 to get a voluntary ban on phosphates and laundry detergents. We worked with them to get a voluntary ingredient disclosure program in place in 2006, uh, which has now been so, uh, augmented, not augmented, but replaced by uh, California SB 258. Uh, we've worked with them to get disclosure of fragrance ingredients, though, they're only disclosing to 100 ppm right now, not disclosing everything. So working with industry, we've managed to get a lot of change. Oh, cradle to cradle, Marsha, thank you. Love this book. <laughs> it is a great book. <laughs> so did that answer your question, Skip? Yeah, yeah, it sounds pretty maybe more influential than I thought. Yeah, no, uh, th that's my job now. Uh, it's internal, it's external facing. So I get to work with industry associations like the American Cleaning Institute, and I get to work with legislators to try to create a more sustainable uh, commerce. Cornelius. Yeah, I just wanted to get you to talk a little bit about your title, and if that uh, terminology has caught on anywhere else and what that means uh, internally to, to you. I like the authenticity part. So, so I made up that title several years ago. Nice. Uh, definitely, we see a lot of chief sustainability officers being uh, uh, christened uh, in industry now. So sustainability has definitely caught on. I don't see authenticity that much, but uh, one of the roles I play is to make sure the things that we do are authentic to the mission and to the values and to the standards of the brand. So um, there are examples that I, I don't think I'll use right now of the company, ah, I can use one, uh, there are two examples uh, of the brand doing things that were not authentic to our mission. So uh, one of them was a retailer asked us to make a softer bath tissue. And it's possible to do that with recycled paper by making it uh, uh, thicker and fluffier, uh, but it means you're using more pulp and that makes it more expensive. So rather than go that route, seventh generation started using virgin fiber in the bath tissue for this retailer. And um, we, we have what we call environmental saving statements. So our bath tissue used to, I don't know if it still does, say if every household bought this four pack of seventh generation recycled bath tissue, we would save 384,000 trees and avoid 14,000 pounds of chlorinated pollutants going into our lakes and streams. Obviously, if you're putting virgin pulp in, you're cutting down trees now. So that number is not the same. And you're using these processes that create chlorinated wastes, uh, chlorinated dioxins, chlorinated phenols and furans, which are highly toxic and pollute many rivers and waterways, especially in states like Wisconsin, which has a huge um, pulp and paper industry, and in the state of Maine here in the east and in the southeast, Alabama, Georgia, etc. So suddenly there appeared in the hallways all around seventh generation signs that said, if you buy our virgin toilet tissue, 
you are cutting down 384,000 trees and polluting our lakes and streams with 14,000 pounds of chlorinated phenol phenols and dioxins. For more information, and I put my name on it because I felt that was the ethical thing to do. That got our CEO's attention. <laughs> So uh, that product, it was agreed, would only be sold to that one retailer, and we would stop selling it as soon as uh, they stopped buying, buying it, which three or four years later was the case. So that's my role in authenticity, to make sure we do what we say we're going to do, and we don't let marketing put more fragrance in those products, Felicia, or put virgin pulp in, uh, or chlorine bleached virgin pulp in our uh, paper products, our recycled paper products. Great, that's great. Yeah, Let, let's say that's what they call a career limiting move. The, mm. uh, <laughs> oh yeah, I've, I've done a lot of those. Yeah, I'm fortunate, I'm far enough in my career that <laughs> it's hard to limit me now. Well, thank you so much to both of our speakers, so informative and uh, uh, wow. Learned, learned a lot. And I don't know about my retention level, but uh, we're now going to have a, a wrap up. Oh, yeah. Bonnie says, if everybody could un unmute and clap, that would be great. And the, the, the clapper is upper left hand corner, at least on my screen, is our uh, president, Felicia Chavez, and she is going to wrap it up. So as Skip was saying, thanks to everybody for joining us today. Thank you so much to Alicia and to Martin for being our guest speakers. Um, we couldn't have these events without you. And of course, thanks to our members who are members of UNA USA, and I'm putting the link in the chat. Um, also, I'm gonna put in the chat a link to sdgmarin.org. Uh, so both on unamarin.org and sdgmarin.org, we've cataloged the videos of this speaker series. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we're two thirds of the way through the SDGs, yay. Um, and so if you're not already a member of UNA USA, uh, we invite you to join. If you're 25 years or younger, it's free. Other than that, I think it's about $50 a year. And 50% um, of the proceeds of your fees, your membership fees come back to the local chapter so that we can pay for the Zoom account and, you know, give a thank you gift, monetary gift to our speakers and pay for a little event, you know, um, food when we're in person, if that ever happens again. <laughs> uh, so it keeps the local chapters alive. And um, thanks also, Ro, for your introduction and talking about the purpose of the UN and the UNA. So just circling back around to your um, helpful filling in of that picture at the beginning. Our next event, oh, also the recording of this event will be emailed to those who registered. And our next event, SDG 13 Climate Action, is currently tentatively scheduled for Saturday, September 17th, uh, 3 to 4.30. If anybody's interested in joining the board of UNA USA, if you're in Marin County, you're always welcome to check us out. Uh, the only requirement is, the requirement requirement is that you're a member of, of UNA USA to be a member of the board. Um, and if you're elsewhere, consider joining your local board. All right. Well, thanks to everybody and enjoy the rest of your um, Saturday evenings, wherever you may be. All righty. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Whoops, I thought I left. <clears throat> Bonnie. Hi, Kathleen. <laughs> Thanks, Ro. I wanted to talk to you for a minute, but maybe this isn't. <clears throat> Hold on a second. Hold on a second.